So hello everyone, my name's Nat and welcome to an introduction to neurodiversity. Today we're going to be learning the A to Zs of dyslexia, autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, and maybe even touch upon a few other areas such as dyscalculia and dysgraphia. Now it'd be great to know your current levels of understanding around neurodiversity. Is this like a brand new term for you? Are you kind of familiar? And it'll help me kind of target it in the right area. Now, oh, nice. King is from Brighton and would like to learn more about neurodiversity. Great stuff. Oh, Yasoda is from London. Has been working with kids with ND. Brilliant. And we are going to be looking at, you know, it is different, like children and adults with ND. It does look very different. So today I'm giving it maybe more emphasis on adults than I would normally children, just because I think that's the area where there's less awareness. April is from London and is here today to record the webinar. As I said, today we are going to be looking at the four most prominent neurodivergence. Now, it's always great to have a good idea of what do we mean by neurodiversity. So feel free to put it in the comments if you feel that you have a good working understanding. The first kind of big misconception is that dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD are neurodiversity. Well, they are, but they're also not. So neurodiversity doesn't mean a particular condition. Neuro means neuro, as in brain, and diversity, we're all different. So in a way, every single person you've ever met on the entire planet has neurodiversity. But if we're talking about people who, the way their brains work and process information is significantly different or diverges quite noticeably from the mainstream, that's when you might have like call it neurodivergent. So neurodivergent is those who don't like process in terms of like the, the way that the mainstream of the world does. And those people, unfortunately, are heavily discriminated against. And we are going to look at today the pros, the cons, the neutrals, and really kind of break it apart. What a lot of people think is either it's a disability or they might be like, it's a superpower. Truthfully, it's neither, it's both. It can have amazing strength and benefits, but it can also have things which can be quite debilitating. So hopefully we can look at that today. Nice. Kinga says learning differences. Yeah, and differences is it. But as we go along today, we are going to continuously be questioning, is it disabling or is it an ability? Now, a little bit about exceptional individuals. Who exactly are we and what makes us exceptional, if I do say so myself? Jokes, we're a nice organisation. Now, we have, oh, we're a social enterprise, which essentially means we're not evil. We're trying to help the world. So we work with organisations, some really big names, and we help them become more inclusive, more diverse, have a good understanding of what it means to really utilise neurodiverse people and get the best from them. But we also use the money we make from that and feed it back into the community where we offer free workshops, webinars and coaching and mentoring. So we're a really nice model, which hopefully you can all agree with. Another top thing is we were established in 2015. We're only a baby. We're still growing up, but we've grown tremendously amount. We now have around about, I would say, 17 employees. And one of the nice things is 80 percent of us are neurodiverse. So not only are we experts by experience, we're also qualified professionals. I'm currently doing a master's in neuroscience. And we also work with neurodiverse people every single day of our life. Well, except from the weekends, I like to have a day off. But typically we work a lot with people who have all different shapes and sizes and ways of looking at the world. And we're experts in consultancy, recruitment and um, employment. So get in touch at the end of this if you think it would be useful. So let's start off with a nice question to all of you. What would you like to learn about neurodiversity? Now, this is, again, a big general one. It could just be, what is it? Or it could be, you know, a really you know, like unique example or a question that you've always wondered. All right, we've got, how can we support ND employees? We're absolutely going to be looking at that. Anyone else? Remember, no question is a dumb question. I think the more we talk about it, the better. How do we know if someone is ND? That's really great. And for those of you who haven't guessed it, ND just stands for neurodivergent. So you'll see that kind of like thrown around quite a lot. 
Any other questions? What are these kind of like things that you've always wondered, but you thought, I'm not sure if I should ask that. Some people might want to know, am I neurodivergent? Does this count as neurodivergent? We've got, how do I get ND employees to see other ND traits? Oh, that's an interesting one. Because sometimes it can be quite difficult. If you've been, if you're neurodiverse, you've been neurodiverse your entire life. How are you ever going to know what's normal and what's not? What's different and what's ab different? Ab different? New word. If anyone is neurodiverse, how do you group? If everyone is neurodiverse, how do you group? Well, that's a good one. So how do we group is there's lots of different abilities in the world, right? And if there are certain abilities, um, certain ways of thinking, which are more or less the same, there's like less differences, that is what we would call neurotypical. We're not saying no, what they're completely the same, but we're saying they're more similar than, you know, than most brains. But neurodivergent people, their way of thinking doesn't really kind of fit or gel in with society. So we're just looking at like what people would like to learn about neurodiversity today. And we've got how to use different neurodiversity terms such as neurodiverse, neurodivergent, et cetera. Yep, there are a lot of them. Um, is neurodiversity covered by the Disability Act? Yeah, but also the Equality Act. And we are going to be looking at it, but, you know, spoiler, it is officially a disability. Whether societally you kind of see it as that or not, you know, when we're looking at legal terms, it is. Okay, great. We've got some really good questions. Now, on this slide, I just want you to put a little pin or in the chat on what neurodivergent traits or um, understanding that you feel you have the most experience with. And while you're doing that, I'm going to give you a quick in a nutshell definition of what all these are. So let's start off with dyslexia. You know, one of the big dogs. Dyslexia is the most commonly known and seemingly understood neurodivergence. But in many ways, that can be part of its downfall because we have these preconceived ideas of what it is. And a lot of them are out of date and just factually not right. But dyslexia is about phonologics, about how the brain processes information. It how it sees like written words and kind of like interprets it in its head. The brain is a marvelous invention and it's always trying to find the quickest way of solving every problem. A dyslexic's brain will look at writing and think, not important. I'm just going to skip that and get to the thing which is really important, which can actually be a really great quality a lot of the time. However, there are instances where the words they're skipping are quite important. So this is why dyslexia isn't a disability in itself, but in the way that our society and our culture has developed, it hasn't particularly favoured people who have that way of digesting information. Then we've got dyspraxia. Dyspraxia, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if some of you have no idea what dyspraxia is. However, dyspraxia is as common as dyslexia. We're looking at about maybe one in 10. Dyspraxia is about is a motor coordination condition and it, how the brain like interprets information and how it kind of uh, displays it. So you might have heard of dyspraxia as the clumsy child syndrome. It's offensive. But anyway, it's because we used to think, you know, it used to be people who couldn't like ride bikes and things, but that's an oversimplification. It's any sort of coordination. So for myself, who is dyslexic and dyspraxic, I really struggle with buttons and like, you know, doing laces, things which are seemingly very easy and obvious. And this is something which can be all quite challenging. But another thing about dyspraxia, it can also affect um, speaking. Because if you think about it, it's not too different. You have the information in your head, I should reply with this, and then you kind of like get it stuck on the tip of your tongue and you can't get it out. Dyspraxia is the kind of the opposite to dyslexia. Where dyslexia is about having, not having information and interpreting it, I'd say unconventionally, dyspraxia is about having information and not being able to get it out. Think of it like a traffic jam in the head. Then we've got autism. Autism is a big one. It deserves a webinar on its own, but it's about seeing the world in a different way. It can affect uh, your communication. It can affect where you socialize in public. It can make it harder to see the little nuances in life, such as little facial expressions or kind of like hidden meanings. Now, autism has many different names. ASC, ASD, Asperger's, 
Maybe I'll talk a bit more about that later, but really quickly, the official term is ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. But if you're feeling a little bit progressive, a lot of people like to say ASC, Autism Spectrum Condition. Not official, but it is a bit more of a lighter term because let's face it, though disorder in a clinical setting, it's quite a fitting word for it in like a general society, societal way, it is quite harsh and it has a lot of negative connotations. And Asperger's, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, since 2013, it has no longer been an official diagnosis in the DSM, the Diagnostic Syst uh, Systematic Manual of Mental Health Disorders. So you're still going to come across the term, but probably for not much longer. Those who were diagnosed with it will probably continue to resonate with it, such as Greta Thunberg, such as Elon Musk. But those diagnosed post-2013, maybe not. Oh, April says there are some webinars on autism available to view on our ER YouTube channel. Nice little plug. We've got ADHD, and that is Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. Now, you might notice it's got a little brackets around the H. Why is that? Well, it used to have multiple names like autism, such as ADHD, ADD. And then we decided to like squash them together and have one diagnosis to rule them all. But there is, it's still worthwhile knowing that there is a difference. So not everyone with ADHD demonstrates a hyperactive tendency, which most people kind of connect to being, having ADHD. And it's really important to remind that because when you look at the typical person who demonstrates the conventional views of um, how we see ADHD, typically it's a white male in a classroom jumping on tables. And that's a really outdated view. Women can have autism. Women can have ADHD. It doesn't really matter what gender you are, what color you are, what background, orientation. These things can affect everyone. The difficulty is, is that a lot of people who are female, for example, do not demonstrate the hyperactivity characteristic, so they kind of get missed off when people are looking at support individuals. Moving on, we've also got dyscalculia and dysgraphia. Now, these are conditions which are neurodiverse, but they're less prominent. You're less likely to bump into them on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, dyscalculia it's kind of like dyslexia of the maths world, but it doesn't mean you're bad at maths. It means that your brain might get like struggle with symbols and like numbers. So for instance, you might know that one plus one equals two, but for some reason you always write three. It's like what you know to what you're able to kind of get out doesn't always kind of correlate. Though it, you could also be bad at maths, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have dyscalculia. So just know they're not one or the same, but they can overlap. And then we have dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is very much like dyslexia, but rather than it being focused around reading, it's focused around handwriting, grip, pressure. If any of you have like terrible handwriting, I'm not saying you have dysgraphia, but it is a common trait and characteristic. Now, the reason why you might not be as familiar with these two is they're what we call like common co-occurring conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But all it essentially means is if you have dyslexia, it's kind of like buy one, get one free. You're very likely to have one of the others. So I'm pretty certain I have dysgraphia and dyscalculia, but I wasn't diagnosed with them because they don't they don't have a, a significant impact on my day to day life. And that is kind of what you need in order to get a diagnosis. They're not going to give them out willy nilly. You have to need it or would benefit from it in some shape or form. And the last two that we're going to mention is Tourette's and OCD. Now, I, I purposely left these two to the end because do they count as neurodivergence? Well, under my definition, it's something which isn't inherently a disability, but it's disabling by society. And it relates to how the brain processes information in an unconventional way compared to the masses. That's a mouthful. They would fit under that. OCD and Tourette's is a different way of processing information. But do they overlap with mental health or mental illness? I would say yes, where the others do not. So the common kind of difference here is that in an ideal world, would you get rid of neurodivergence? No, you wouldn't. Of course, we love neurodivergence. It's needed for innovation, for diversity. 
it's great. But if you ask people who have OCD and Tourette's, particularly those who have it quite severe or quite high needs, they would probably argue they would rather not have it. I have a form of OCD myself, and for me, I struggle to see the benefits from it personally. But this is just my view, so I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions. And as I can see here, most of you, as I suspected, have the most experience with dyslexia. All right, so I did promise that we talk a little bit about co-occurrence. Now, another word for it is comorbidity. And we tend not to use that word too much because morbid, you know, sounds a bit depressing. Maybe it's a bit fitting now because Halloween's around the corner, but I think co-occurrence has a nicer tone to it. It just means if you have one condition, you're very likely to have another. So for instance, if you have autism, you're very likely to also have anxiety. If you have OCD, it's not unthinkable to think that you might also have sleep problems. They're not a guaranteed thing, but you're normally twice as likely to have one of these other conditions if you already have one of the others. One thing that you will learn through today is that a lot of the neurodivergences such as dyslexia, autism, you know, they're not, they're not normally the most like debilitating element of your entire life, but they're things which make any other activity in your life more challenging. So let's say you're uh, going to, um, you have autism. If you're just at home, not, not an issue. If you're going to a party, suddenly this is going to make life a lot more difficult and you're going to get more anxious and the anxiety is probably going to lead to sleep problems. And that after a long amount of time could lead to clinical depression. So you can kind of see how these things start to kind of like link in. Yes, they are not mental illness, but unfortunately they go together like two peas in a pod because you're spending your entire life swimming upstream and that can get tiring. One in how many people are neurodiverse? So open to all of you, how many people do we think are approximately neurodiverse in the world? And as you can see, all the countries that are green on this map are countries that we have data on. There's still a lot of countries where we need to learn. Wow, we've got a full house, one in seven. Yes, incredibly common. You know, we always think when we talk about neurodiversity, oh, it's like, you know, we're talking about like minorities. We're talking about like just a small percentage, but we're not. That approximately, you know, dyslexia is about one in 10, dyspraxia is about one in 10, autism is about, I think, one in 57, ADHD is about one in 100. It depends where you get your stats from, but this gives you a kind of a good, like, broad understanding. In the UK alone, about 6.3 million individuals have dyslexia. And I think that's like 700 million people worldwide. It's incredibly prominent. And I think we, this is why attending sessions like today are so important. So, you know, good on you for attending today. Question two or four. What percentage of managers do not understand neurodivergence? So we're not talking about managers who are like hate us. <laughs> we're talking about managers who want to help, but don't have the tools or knowledge or the understanding to kind of do something about it if, say, one of us was to disclose. Now, just so you know, where do we get this stat from? A few years back, uh, exceptional individuals worked hand in hand with the government report, uh, which did a big study on this. Oh, interestingly, yeah, a lot of you thought it was uh, 47. Unfortunately, it is 74%. That's incredibly high. And as someone who works with employers on a day-to-day -day basis, doing consultancy around neurodivergence, Unfortunately, this is true. Most people have a kind, loving heart, but most people have out of date information. And with that information, you're going to be trying to push it and it's not going to stick. So it's really important to stay up to date. Do not see today as tick, I've done the training. See it as a starting point on where I can go beyond here. Okay, three or four. What age group is most likely to disclose their neurodiversity? And, you know, I'm saying neurodiversity as a broad word here because it doesn't just have to be autism, dyslexia, but essentially disclosing their learning preferences, how they best learn or how they operate in the world. 
are we talking about the teeny boppers, the 18 to 30 year olds, or uh, people a bit older in life? Oh, interestingly, 18 to 30. Does anyone want to give me a guess why they think younger people are more likely to disclose? I guess because they're aware that they have a diagnosis, whereas the other age groups may, may have had troubles learning, if you like, but they don't necessarily associate it with a particular condition. Nice. No, and you're completely right there. There are so many different reasons. So one, there's more awareness today. There's less stigma. Doesn't mean no stigma, but less stigma. There's been more funding in schools and colleges to kind of get official diagnosis. And more people are just generally aware. Now, this is great news, but it's really important to know this because say if you are over 30, does it mean that you are less likely to be neurodiverse? Not at all. You can be neurodiverse and 100 years old, but people who are of an older age, one might be more concerned or afraid of the stigma or the connotations which are attached to that label, or they might just not know they are neurodiverse because they never had that training or diagnosis at a younger age. So it's why we must always kind of change our opinion that being neurodiverse isn't an entry level condition, it's something which affects all age ranges. The only difference is the older you get, the more you learn to find coping mechanisms and mask the way you kind of portray yourself. So yeah, I think that's probably one of the important things to like learn and know. Oh nice, Yasoda says older people are getting diagnosed now after their kids have got a diagnosis. Absolutely right. And that's because neurodivergence is hereditary, which means it runs in the family. All it means is like if your mum has it, the likelihood of you having it goes up a lot higher. But do know it's not a guarantee. You know, the genes can like skip generations. So your grandparents might have it, but never be very aware. Your parents may not, but you might. It's a good, it's a quite a good way of kind of at least asking the questions that if someone says, Oh yeah, my son got diagnosed with dyspraxia. Well, maybe you might want to have a little think, you know, hmm, how much of the characteristics which I see in them do I also see in myself? OK, and now the last one and then we're done with fun. What solution can managers do to best support neurodiverse talent flourish? So if you could do one of these, which one do you think would have the biggest impact? One, creating a safe space for disclosure where people feel happy to talk about it. Universal design. This is when everything is created with everyone in mind, not trying to limit anyone else out. Knowing people in your team's individual strengths. So I don't care about your label, but I know you learn very good with visual information. Or supporting with advocacy, you know, encouraging training. Okay, nice stuff. So inclusive universal design got the top marks. Now, these, you know, everyone's a winner on this. Tick, tick, tick. I wanted everyone to walk away with a prize today. <laughs> But honestly, all of these could make a massive difference. So when you create a place for people to disclose, know that there's stigma attached to neurodivergence, like it or not. So we need to create opportunities where people can disclose every step of the journey, you know, on the job description, maybe on the interview, maybe on the onboarding process, when you're doing your one-to-ones, when you're coming up to your probationary meeting, make sure people feel there's multiple opportunities because it takes time to build that level of trust. Inclusive universal design is just making sure that spaces work for everyone. You know, those with uh, people with autism can struggle with like intense fluorescent lights. They can struggle with uh, buildings which have too much echo. Are we taking this into consideration when we're building things? Knowing someone's strengths. Today, we're talking a lot about labels, but honestly, forget about the labels. The most important thing is to know that in people are individuals. So what can we do which benefits them? If you start rolling out a blanket process, this is what we're going to do for everyone who has ADHD in the company. You're going to find that you're not getting the results you hope for because we are individuals. We're neurodiverse. It's in the name. And lastly, advocacy. You know, we've got to keep these workshops up, keep this training going because it's continuously updating. Our knowledge is for always changing and it just kind of helps keep the momentum going. All right, let's see how you all did. Oh, oh, wow. Croc did it. Congratulations, Croc. Tom was a very close second. Tweeto, third. And Boaty McBoatface, a nice fourth. All right, well done, everyone. I noticed there was two Mac Boaty Mac Boat faces. 
Not sure how that happened. So now I'm going to give you a bit more of a deeper understanding on how would you classify what it means to be neurodiverse. So we use this thing called the spiky profile. And for me, this gives a much more clear understanding of what it means to be neurodiverse. So on this, all I want you to do is go like, if you think you're great at maths, rate it to a number five. If you think oh, I'm not that good with analytics, you might want to do a zero or a one. So on this, I can see we've got a lot of creatives in the house. Okay, it's quite broad all around. Now, what we're hopefully trying to show from this is that people have all different skills, you know, peaks and troughs. And the traditional view of a learning disability is focusing on the negative, focusing on what an individual is not able to do. So uh, they're not really very good with relationships, not that good at decision making. But that is one, not a very progressive way of thinking of it, and also factually incorrect, because being neurodiverse isn't about a deficit in ability, it's in the fluctuation of ability. So it's about the difference between the skills you are absolutely smashing and the skills that you find more challenging or maybe don't come as naturally. So for instance, you might be really great at maths, you might be better than a lot of your peers at maths, but you might really struggle at communication. So if you think that you have a big difference between the skills you can do to the skills you find more challenging, that is a very strong neurodiverse quality. I always say to people, being neurodiverse isn't about being bad at stuff. If you are just genuinely bad at everything, you're not neurodiverse. You've probably got something else going on. But if you think that your skills don't really like match up, why am I so good at talking, but I'm so bad at writing? If there's a big difference between those two, that is what we mean by neurodiverse. Hopefully that makes sense. So now I'm gonna do a bit of a deep dive on dyslexia. As I said, dyslexia is about phonologics, how the brain interprets written information. And it is different for every individual, but I'll give you an idea of how it affects myself. And I'm quite heavily dyslexic. So for me, I can absolutely read, I can write, you know, I can do all those great things, but they didn't come naturally to me. I learned a lot, lot later than my peers. And that's because the way that I was taught was a neurotypical way of teaching. And that's about seeing words and breaking them down like dyslexia. And my brain just isn't able to like join the dots. So I remember words by flat images. I see them as like kind of just shapes. So if I see the word dyslexia, dyslexia that's how I see it so the more words I'm exposed to the kind of stronger understanding I get for it and that's brilliant but it does mean that if I come across a word I've never seen before I have no ideas I find it more challenging to break it down and to like work it out so I can absolutely read but the way I go about it is um it just doesn't match up with how books were kind of created to read in the first place Top tip, I'm a big fan of having audio books and a physical book at the same time because my brain will try to like skip words, as I said earlier. So the audio book kind of kicks my brain into focus and says, you know what? Don't forget that word. Quite important. I'd also make up words. So when I read Harry Potter when I was younger, I could not read the word McGonagall. So I just called her Steve. Um, so when I watch movies, I'm all like, oh, Steve, because for me, my brain translates it and think, well, actually, me being able to read that word isn't so important, but I appreciate that I know it's a noun. So you, the brain gets really creative. Now, a great example of someone who is dyslexic and smashing it is this amazing powerhouse of a woman, Margaret um, Adrilyn Pocock. She is a British space scientist and an educator. So you might think space scientist, very, very smart. And indeed, you're right. But as a dyslexic, you know, it can be really challenging. They write a lot of papers. They are always kind of uh, have to be very spot on with their facts and details. And this just wasn't Margaret's experience. She kind of struggled to fit in with the other space scientists. But what she realized, yes, while she struggled with the more kind of conventional academic approach, she was really good at explaining complex problems in a way which was easy and digestible. And that made her an amazing educator. So where her peers were very, very smart individuals, but they couldn't explain it to other people, that's where Margaret really thrived. 
So her skill set was complementary to the profession and actually made her stand out from her peers, which led a big part to her success. So yeah, look her up if you don't know who she is, she's great. Now I'm gonna do a little quick empathy challenge on what it is like to have dyslexia. So get ready. Ah, oh, yes, here we are. So I want you all to try reading this in your head. I'll stop, I'll put all you out of your misery, okay? Because it's not meant to be easy, but it's not impossible. I reckon a lot of you were able to read a lot of it. And that's very much like dyslexia. Only like 1% of dyslexics cannot read. The vast majority can. But every time they're reading, the brain has to interpret letters in a different way to a neurotypical person. They have to kind of like have an algorithm in their head and like kind of move things around. So I'll read it. I'll say a dyslexic who had a friend, <laughs> a friend who has dyslexia described to me how she experiences reading. She can read, but it takes a lot of concentration and the letters seem to jump around. I remember reading about. So you see that though I was able to read it, it took me longer to read it. But if I came across a word I've never seen before, I just do not have that algorithm in my head, which is able to interpret that writing. This is why people who are lawyers, people who are doctors, you know, any sort of profession which has its own terminology, you can absolutely be dyslexic and thrive. But if you come across a word you've never seen before, it can throw you off. And, you know, you'll end up just skipping it and missing it and calling it Steve. Dyslexia does get easier with age, but it doesn't disappear with age. And if you have a change of situations or like environments or workplaces, you can notice some of the challenges which you thought you had overcome reappear and become kind of more noticeable. So some top tips on supporting people with dyslexia goes as followed. Provide projects that allow them to engage their creativity. People with dyslexia are really creative and we're not saying good with arts and crafts. We're talking about just solving problems. Um, you know, finding like alternative ways of kind of reaching the same goal, but in a different way. Be aware that the extra effort that is often applied to basic tasks I like to uh, describe dyslexia like a duck on water, chilling on top, enjoying its little duck life, but underneath it is paddling like crazy and it can be tiring. So though it looks simple, it does require more processing energy. Be vigilant and approachable. A person with dyslexia may not disclose until they feel overwhelmed. Unfortunately, this is a really, really big one. In an ideal world, people would tell you straight away, hey, just to let you know I have dyslexia, is there any support we can have in place for the future? But the reality is people will normally tell you when they're at their wits end, when they're about to get like disciplined or not pass probation. Be prepared that this is very likely to occur, just of the stigma that is currently around it. This is why what we do is so important. Dyslexia can look different for everyone. I've given you a little glimpse into my world today, but I appreciate that for other people, they might have a whole different way of understanding it or expressing it. And they might not even be able to express it, but they still kind of are dyslexic. Whew, okay, moving nicely on to dyspraxia. So dyspraxia is about motor coordination. And as I mentioned, used to be known as a bit of a clumsy disorder, but I think people realize it doesn't kind of paint the picture. It can affect people in all different ways. Imagine if you were to, uh, like, if I was to ask you a question and you know the answer and you like get this filing cabinet and you get the answer, job done. But if you're dyspraxic, maybe someone asks you the question and your question, your answer is all the way at a really top high filing cabinet and you have to reach up and get it. Now, that extra energy to reach up to that high filing cabinet means it gives you a bit of a delay. And that is like dyspraxia. It doesn't affect intelligence, but it does affect memory recall and being able to like retrieve that. So you're riding a bike and your brain's like, all right, so I've got to look at what's in front of me. I'm listening to my AirPods. I've got to push the pedals. There's multiple processes happen at once. Now, if one of those processes kind of get modeled up or switched or blocked, you fall off your bike. And that's kind of how dyspraxia works. So it makes sense why people struggle with buttons, with shoelaces, anything which requires too much information being shoved down your little brain hole is official term and kind of being processed and understood. So my role model for dyspraxia, believe it or not, is the English model, Cara Devlevine, and she is great. So she is a prime example of someone who has a challenge in a certain area, but rather than avoid it, they embrace it. 
So Kara is a model, right, which requires tremendous amounts of coordination and grace, and yet she has dyspraxia. She really struggles wearing high heels, but she does it anyway. And rather than kind of like try to avoid areas which she knows might be more challenging for her, she goes above and beyond. Did you know she's an amazing drum player? She can also play a guitar, which is impressive on its own if you have dyspraxia, but she can play it at the back of her head like that, which is ridiculous. So she goes above and beyond to push herself. So those who are neurodiverse can be really quite innovative and purposely do things which they know they find challenging. This is important to know because let's say you're working with someone who tells you they have dyspraxia or dyslexia, you might think, I'm going to help them out and I'm going to not give them a job around this area because I know they'll find it difficult. Do not make that assumption. They might actually like doing those tasks. So my top tips, actually, before I go on my top tips on dyspraxia, I'll give you a little bit more insight. So dyspraxia, as well as all the others we're talking about today, are not very consistent. Yes, they affect you from birth or early or early developing years to death. It's a lifelong condition, but the way it affects you changes. So it can depend on all different factors such as mood, environment, conditions, stress. They can all impact. So let's say, I don't know, I asked you, what day of the week is it? Now, what? And, you know, you might get easily distracted or I ask you, hey, what day of the week is it? And Thursday, so you can get it, but it takes a little bit longer. Or someone might ask you again and you'll be like, hmm, I, I don't know. I don't know. So you can see that the outcome can be different. And this really depends on a lot of different factors. So if you know someone is particularly stressed or under a lot of pressure, then these qualities can be more apparent. And you might want to like intervene or support in advance. So top tips for dyspraxia include allow flexibility in working style. Trust me, they might not be an expert in their own brain, but they, they know far more than anyone else in the world. So kind of if they found coping strategies, let them work with it. Provide projects that allow for continuous attention rather than switching. Those with dyspraxia can really struggle with having to switch tasks. So if you say, hey, I need to do that, 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 that can be overwhelming. But if you say, OK, this is the task, do this, let them do it and come to you secondary and then ask for a secondary task, you are going to find a much more fluid approach, which allows them to kind of really get in the groove. Have a way for them to be heard if they spot someone they regard something to, to be heard if they respond to something they regard as important. There's an old expression, use it or lose it, and that has never been truer than for someone who has dyspraxia. If something pops into your head, you your brain is continuously thinking about it because if, if you're like concentrating on anything else at the same time, it can just like evaporate. You'll realize later as we talk about ADHD that in many ways this is kind of the counter of it. So autism is a big one. It's a whole different way of processing the world. It's really interesting. And I gave a bit of like information on the different names such as ASD, autism spectrum disorder, autism spectrum condition, Asperger's. And it has been really kind of misunderstood in time. I'd like to focus on a bit more now about Asperger's in different terms. You might have heard things like Asperger's. Well, that was really useful back in the day because autism was so stigmatized that no one wanted to be diagnosed with it. So, so many people weren't getting the help they needed. So Asperger's was kind of a, a different term. However, it started having the opposite effect. And there was this kind of like snobbery that if you had Asperger's, you were very able to be in society and function. And those who didn't have Asperger's and just conventional autism kind of got seen as less good. So what they did is they combined the terms. You may also have heard of terms like high functioning, low functioning in order to describe autism. They aren't great terms anymore. And the reason is, is high functioning typically means can like live in the world, can get a job, you know, have a family, you know, can really live independently. But by calling someone high functioning, you're calling someone else low functioning, which again is kind of setting a bar and lowering their potential in the world. 
And in many ways, you know, high functioning doesn't mean smart. Low functioning doesn't mean dumb. It means in terms of how the brain processes. So for instance, you could be nonverbal and that would mean you were low functioning, but you could be the smartest person you've ever met. And I know many people who are nonverbal who are insanely intelligent. So that's why those terms, they just, they're outdated. So forget about them and use ASD as a good rule of thumb. However, if someone says to you, oh, hey, I have Asperger's, that's fine. But it's just good to understand a bit of the context. Now, my role model for autism is Greta Thunberg, the socialist activist, the well, actually probably a socialist, but um, the environmental activist. Now, she's great because autism, I sometimes like to explain it like the blinkers on a horse that you kind of see kind of roaming the streets. On some ways, that can be debilitating. It means that you can struggle to see the world around you. And those of autism might have, they struggle pitch, picking up on little social cues, on understanding the world. Downside, right? But on the positive, with the little blinkers, what they see in front of them is hyper-focused, really passionate, able to really absorb and focus on the thing which is important. And that kind of relates to autism in many ways. A lot of those with autism will have really distinct and unique interests. And if you can find a role or a job or a position which really allows them to utilize that area of interest, you, you try and stop them. They're going to put 110% into everything they do. I think that autism in the right environments is absolutely a strength, but in the wrong environment, it can make every day extra challenging. So I like to see autism as an opportunity for like greatness, but do not think of it as a superpower. I'm really for that because a superpower kind of implies that it's all, all good, and but the struggles are very real. So if you want the benefits of neurodivergency, then you need to support the areas which are more challenging and they go hand in hand. So my little analogy for autism is as followed. What operating system do you prefer? What is your go-to? Are you a Windows guy or are you a Mac guy? And I mean guys in, you know, male or female or anything. All right, nice. So I can see most of you have put Windows and only one of you have put Apple. Now hear me out. The world was created for Windows. Most computer programs are created with Windows in mind. Mac users have to miss out. They don't get to use those programs. Is that because Windows is better? No, I would argue that both systems are equally as good. Um, they just have different ways of processing information. You can probably see where I'm going here. But because the world was created mostly for Windows, it makes it easier for Windows. And this is exactly the same with autism. There's nothing wrong with autism. It's just a different way of seeing the world and understanding it. But the world we live in was created with a very neurotypical way in mind. So the challenges are very, very real. April says, in my childhood, youth and early adulthood, I prefer to use Windows since early adulthood, I prefer to use Mac. Yeah, and it can change. Adults who have autism will typically do masking. So they're able to blend in society, but they're still having to put the extra processing power in to make sense of this crazy world we live in. Try not to read too much into this analogy, but it gives you an idea about how something can be different, but not worse, uh, different and not really suited for the environment that they find themselves in. My top tips for autism is allow them to follow their own processes to achieve their goals. As I said before, if you've got any of these conditions, you might still not be able to verbalize it brilliantly, but you're the world's best expert on your own brain. So if you can say, I don't care how you get this job done, as long as you get it done, they might go a different route, but that route works for them. Provide projects that involve their interests. The brain is always looking for things that are engaging and interesting. And for some people, that urge is even stronger than for others. That urge is really strong in those with autism. So find something which can really like captivate them and you will never regret it. Repetitive tasks can be comforting. So jobs which we might find quite mundane, quite boring, 
those with autism might find quite comforting. So they prefer patterns and repetitions and kind of uh, things which they know the answer that are more black and white. Please use today as a good rule of thumb, but not a complete absolute rule. But this has been quite a common experience. Do not be alarmed by atypical physical behavior. What do we mean by that? Well, have you heard of a thing called stimming where people like move their arms and kind of like flap about? At first, that could seem quite odd, right? Like, why are you doing that? But when you think about it, it's not so weird at all. You know, when you stub your toe, you might swear or you might, you know, shout something out. It's a way of kind of releasing pent up energy, which kind of help regulate your body. Um, stimming and moving is just another way of regulating your emotions. It could be that I don't know how to express myself. So it just kind of like boils up and comes out in another way. It shouldn't be something we are scared of or unsure about. Um, for instance, you know, I might be around the house and I might just go, meow. <laughs> and I do it because I don't care what society thinks. I enjoy doing it. And those with autism, they typically have less awareness on their surroundings. So they care less about what other people think. So with these sort of things, I would say in an ideal world, we'd all stim because we just want to be ourselves and it doesn't matter what we look or sound like to others. And the last one we're going to do is ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And this could be multiple. So let's break it down. Attention. This is how the brain can focus on different activities. Attention deficit. Deficit, bit of a downer. It means you can struggle. Hyperactive, it means my, your attention might be low and you might be like easily distracted. And disorder is like a type of a condition. And a lot of people would always see ADHD as the lack of attention, but actually it's not really like that. It's in many ways, it's the abundance of attention. So you are able to like focus on being attentive to everything. And it can make it quite difficult to focus on one particular task. Now, some people will show the hyperactivity -ness, which might show quite outgoing, um, quite extroverted. But some people might not show the hyperactiveness and might be more introverted, but just struggle with attention. And as we talked about earlier, if those who are female typically do not always demonstrate the hyperactive side, but they do demonstrate the attention side. Just know that it can kind of like you can have one, you can have the other, you can have both. And the role model we're going to be using for ADHD today is Simone Biles. And I don't know if you've heard of her. She's great. She's an American gym lass and she's one of the most decorated ones in all of time. And she is so dedicated. She's able, she was at the best of the best in what she does. And with ADHD, a way I like to explain it to people is that, say on a day-to-day, -day, right, you're using this much energy, you know, throughout the day, you're using a, a kind of an average amount of energy to get to where you want. Those with ADHD might go, might use all their energy up right away. So that short amount of time is a right power hour and they are able to like perform incredible. But the rest of the day, there's not much fuel left in the tank and it can be really draining. And it's why that if you can't expect us to operate in the same like time scales. So for instance, I might do my webinar today. I'm putting a lot of energy into it. I'm going to be exhausted afterwards. So you can't expect us to work at the same level consistently just because the way we are distributing our energy is not as consistent, but there are benefits to it. Now with Simone, she was great at the Olympics, but people pushed her too much. They expected her to perform at such a high level so consistently throughout the entire Olympics and all her other events. And as you may or may not know, she ended up leaving the Olympics due to mental health challenges. And for me, you know, hats off to her. That was a really brave decision to do. And unfortunately, as we said, mental health and neurodiversity, two separate things. But because we live in a world which isn't designed for us, mental health does go hand in hand. So it's not uncommon to struggle with mental health and also have ADHD. So do bear in mind, if you've got someone with ADHD, they're probably working in the evenings. They're probably like working on break times because they're trying to compensate because the way they work is often perceived as less productive, even though in reality, it's just a different way of kind of distributing um, focus. So a few top tips for supporting ADHD 
is be aware that they may speak fast. Yeah. But remember that because speaking fast doesn't mean processing fast. They're not the same thing. Give them time to digest information. So if I talk really, really fast back to you, just because I'm mirroring you, that doesn't mean that they can kind of comprehend it. So I always try to verbally say something, then write it out via email as well, or write it out via email and have a little video chat if I'm doing online. Try to always present information in multiple formats because some will get through that filter and others will not. So you're kind of covering all basis that way. Provide prioritized tasks. With those with ADHD, it's kind of different to those with autism and dyspraxia in terms of liking things very like laid out. They like having that freedom to choose and to pick and move around, but it can be quite difficult to know what's the most important task. So what I like to do to my uh, colleagues with ADHD is say, you know what? These are all the things, I don't mind what you do today, but these few tasks here, they're really important. Those are the things that we need to have done. Do them in whatever order you want, but if you can make sure that these are done and it can give a bit of structure, but not too much. So quick question back to all of you. What are some strengths that are associated with being neurodiverse? And why am I asking this? Is we have spent all of the last hundred years since we've been quite familiar with neurodivergence, talking about all the downsides and negatives. I think it's really positive to value and appreciate the strengths that come with being neurodiverse. We're not saying the struggles aren't real, they are real, but I think we've done enough focus on them for now. Entrepreneurial, absolutely. Did you know that 40% of all self-made millionaires are reportedly dyslexic? Why? We're good at thinking outside of the box. We're not good with the status quo. Creativity. As they say, there's more than one way to skin a cat, brutal, but essentially means there's multiple ways of achieving the same outcome. And dyslexics are, and dyspraxics and ADHDs and those with autism are really good at that. Focus, nice, and focus it could be hyper-focus, giving lots of time, focus out of the box, perfectionism, that's a double-edged sword right there. Innovation, nice, try having innovation without having neurodivergence, not gonna happen. Solution focused, Brilliant. We've got some really great ideas here. So that kind of like concludes our main part. But what I would like to mention to all of you is that if you are neurodiverse or you resonate with it or you know someone who might be, knowing that the sooner you get help, the better. And this isn't to say you need the help right now, but it's kind of future planning. So there's this scheme called Access to Work, which, again, you might be familiar with or may not be. But it's really useful and get in contact with us if this does relate to you. But essentially, if you have a job, you're eligible. All you have to do is get a short assessment. We find out how your brain works, how your brain, like what it works well with, what it finds more difficult. We write up a nice assessment for you and we send it off. And if it gets all approved, we can give you tech training, equipment, coaching, mentoring, and it just sets you up for success. This is something which if you're in the UK, I highly recommend that you're at least aware of. So again, a workplace needs assessment. It isn't just for someone with a bad back, it's for anyone who might have challenges in the workplace, whether it be right this moment or challenges which might crop up later down the line. Now we've reached the end, but question time. Any questions on what you've heard today, learned today, anything that you want me to clarify, Mr. Al, or just generally let me know. Now is a very good time. Is there a cost to access to work? Great question. If you, I mean, it's a complicated one, but in short, if you are brand new to an organization within six weeks, always free. If there are less than 50 employees, always free. If you do not match those two criteria, there's a slight cost, but it's really discounted. Um, but definitely get in contact with us if you have more questions on that. Do I need a diagnosis to be eligible for support? No, you don't. You just need to resonate because unfortunately being neurodiverse, eh, you know, there's a little bit of sexism and racism baked into it, like all things in life. So if you say are from a minority background and a female, the likelihood of you being diagnosed plummets dramatically. So it'd be very unfair to say you can only get support if you are diagnosed. So absolutely not. If you have resonated or connected with some of the things we said today, 
eligible. What advice would you give to an employer to help their neurodiverse employee ease? I would say treat everyone like an individual, find out how their brain works and try and find ways which complement each other and work together. Labels are useful as a starting point, but as we get a bit more deeper, we realize that they can be quite limiting. So just because today you know a bit about autism, that doesn't mean you know someone who has autism with a little bit of dyspraxia, who also has things going on at home, who's also from another culture. There's so many factors when it comes to understanding how people see and process the world, it would be a disservice to them to kind of pigeonhole them with a very short definition on what one condition is. We are individuals. Can I speak with my employer about access to work? Absolutely. You know, you can get them to get in touch. You can get in contact with us. Um, ultimately, someone in the organization will have to approve it. That could be line manager, HR, but it's good to have a chat first. A lot of questions about access to work today. Can the ATW extend to employers slash managers? If so, how and the costs? Well, you can get workshops for the entire employees. I always think the best approach to supporting someone isn't saying you've got a problem, here's a solution, but we appreciate the world isn't built very fairly. At me as a manager, I'm gonna learn the most I can in order to make the world as inclusive as possible. And you as a neurodiverse individual will try and learn the best way you can on trying to explain how your brain works and how other people can support you. So try and see it like a 50-50 approach rather than all the emphasis on the person who is neurodiverse. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Well, any last questions? Oh, but how do I start the chat with an employer? Well, I always like to go in with solution based. So rather than saying, hi, I, I, I'm I, now, I have autism. I personally wouldn't do that because there's a lot of misinformation around autism. So if you say that to them, they're gonna have all these preconceived ideas of what autism is. I like to go in them and say, hey, I have autism. This is what it means for me. This is how it affects me. I was wondering if we could work together and see if there's any things that we can do which can support this. What this is doing is kind of being a bit more open, kind of already challenging them on what it means. Any solution which would benefit someone who is neurodiverse, if it is a good solution, would also benefit anyone who is neurotypical. We're not here to kind of create a bigger divide. It's just about kind of creating a level playing field. Man, so many great questions, everyone. How did you get, get involved with exceptional individuals? And do you enjoy your role? Nice. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I got involved because I'm incredibly neurodiverse and the way my brain works, I find it really difficult to kind of get into typical employment. I need a lot of innovation. I need roles which are very spontaneous and very free, but also people who kind of get it. I think having a role you enjoy is really important. If you do hire people who are neurodiverse and you found a, and your role is really inclusive, you'll find that the retention rate goes up dramatically. Unfortunately, there aren't many inclusive jobs out there. So if you do find an inclusive one, you are more likely to stay there for a longer time. But there is so much benefit to employing neurodiverse individuals, not just for the terms of the innovation, but also for like the high retention rates. And you'll also find it just makes for a more well-rounded, defined workplace where people can share their difference. Well, I'm going to end it there. But what I will say is if you have any further questions, drop me a message. My door is always open and you can always find out more information. So here is our details. Um, we're exceptional individuals. On a website, you can find quizzes to like find out if you have neurodiverse characteristics. You can get coaching and mentoring. We do workshops, audits, and memberships for, all, for companies. Here's our email. My name's been Nat. That's N-A-T. And you can just do that at exceptionalindividuals.com. And I'm more than happy to answer questions as we go along. But I really hope you found that useful today. I'm going to leave there, but I really hope you kind of got a few gems from today and kind of see things from a slightly different perspective.